My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University Library, and I'm here in Mays County, Oklahoma, in Locust Grove, as, and we're doing an interview today with John Cavalier regarding his Centennial Farm, and this is for our Oklahoma Centennial Farm Families Oral History Project. So thank you for having me today. Well, you're welcome. Let's start by having you tell us how your family came to initially have this land. Okay. Uh, a fellow named Joseph Van, who was my great-great-uncle, uh, came here in 1829. Uh, sold his plantation down in Georgia. He lived at Beaver Pond, Georgia. Sold it and came to Oklahoma because he knew the Indians was going to get moved anyway. So he's foresighted enough to know that. Uh, he came here and started a new plantation with uh, his family and nine slaves. Uh, he cleared land and what have you around here and probably, I don't know, 40 or 50 acres is probably what a person at that time could handle, you know. So don't know for sure, but anyway, uh, he died in uh, 1877, and his family lived here a few years. And then in 1891, my grandfather, John Tyler Cavalier, and my grandmother, Eliza, bought the improvements on the place. At that particular time, the Cherokee Nation owned all the land. Okay. And the only thing that anybody had was the improvements. And you could use all the land you wanted. So... Uh, that's kind of the way it started at that point. Yeah. That's where we acquired it. Uh, and then in 19 and five, uh, they started allotting the land. And my grandmother took this allotment on this acreage here uh, for her allotment. My grandfather, I just found out lately that he, where some of his was, this, these allotments were scattered all over the state and all over the county maybe 10 acres here and 40 acres there and what have you. And, uh, but anyway, I found part of his finally. But initially, the family, there was uh, eight of them. There was uh, in the family, and they should have got about 110 acres apiece. So in theory, they probably had around 800 and some acres, but it was scattered. This portion here was together is the reason it's all stayed together and in the family all this time. Okay. All the out, out going pieces was sold off. Or, and how much was this? How how much acreage for this? Uh, this, one? this farm uh, that my grandma and grandfather had was about 350 acres. Uh, my uncle had land across the road, his allotments, and then another uncle north of, on north of here, he had uh, 110 acres up there. And, uh, but this was the main farm here. And it's down to, my brother and I have 240 acres. Total or each? Total now. Total. Uh, total, both of us. How, uh, how did John and Eliza meet? Or did, were they already here? Or uh, where did they, had they come from? He was, <clears throat> he was a school teacher. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was a school teacher. He went to school at the seminary in Tahlequah. Got an education. While he was there, he got kicked out. <laughs> but anyway, he wound up being a teacher. And uh, I guess he was teaching in this area, and she was one of his students. I think she was about 15 when they got married. So that's that's how they met. And to get allotments, did <clears throat> they have to be Cherokee? or Yeah, to be Cherokee, Cherokee, yeah. Okay. Uh, his grandfather was a half breed, and my grandmother was a quarter. Okay. And they had how many children? Uh, they had uh, seven, and then they raised uh, a son, or uh, her nephew. They raised her nephew. So when it, when it was time to, to share this with siblings, how did you end up with it? Or your father end up with it? Well, when my grandmother died in 1947, well, my grandfather died in 1917 of a stroke, and then grandmother run the farm she run the damn thing, too. <laughs> uh, she died in uh, 1947, and my dad uh, inherited part of it here, and then he bought the rest of it. Okay. And that's the way him and my mother wound up with it. Okay. And then your parents had 
Yeah, and I think it's about 1985 they deeded the, uh, we all agreed to how we was going to divide it up. I got uh, 60 acres here with the home and all the improvements on it. My brother got land 110 acres north of here and 70 south. Okay. So uh, we've been maintaining it ever since. <laughs> Well, it's a large piece and it's pretty. Do you have any idea why they why they picked this particular piece to begin with? Any? No, I don't. Other than it's probably similar to where they came from in Georgia. Okay. Most of the, you know the Indians come to this country and uh, especially around Tahlequah and down in there was one of their favorite places. But the farmers, the half breeds, uh, came up here. Joseph Ann was a half breed or mixed bred. Uh, they were the farmers and the most, well, I'd say the most productive uh, of the Cherokees. Well, uh, well, the full bloods, they wanted to keep the old ways and they, did, they didn't want to have anything to do with the allotted land. Hmm. They made them take it. And consequently, it just, it didn't last very long. <clears throat> White man beat them out of it over a pint of liquor. But anyway, some of them managed to hang on, but a lot of them just it just went. They didn't have no need for it other than to hunt on it. Well, what what were some of the crops or products that your grandparents? Well, they raised uh, corn, wheat, oats, maize. You used to call it kaffir corn, some kind of head feed, high gear, sorghum. Do you remember much about them? Or I guess they weren't, the grandmother had already. Well, my grandfather died when my dad was 10. So you wouldn't Only have, 10 you, years so you old. Wouldn't have I remember my grandmother. I've got numerous pictures of her holding me. I guess I was the baby in, at that particular time. And I got a lot of pictures of uh, her holding me. And I remember her. She was a large woman. Uh, always went to church on Sunday. Now, nothing got in the way of that. And uh, she was strong, strong-minded. In fact, the some of the Cherokee neighbors around here I've talked to her said she was the J.R. of Spring Creek. <laughs> <laughs> she ruled everything with the iron fist. And she had been a school teacher, right? No, no she nothing. hadn't. She had... Her husband was. Okay. But John Cavalier was school okay. teacher. She was a student. She probably just went to the eighth grade at the Hogan Institute over here by Locus. Do you remember some of the things she cooked? That she cooked? Uh, yeah, uh, we'd go to church on Sunday and come back and we'd get a chicken killed and cook for dinner that day <laughs> with all the gravy and biscuits and all that kind of stuff. Uh, her and my mother and the kitchen used to be back there in, in the back of the house. Uh, had an old wood cook stove back there. They done all the canning and cooking and everything there. And uh, it was so damn hot in the summertime. The flies wouldn't even come in and they'd have to worry about shutting the doors. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, so they had a lot She was quite part. a lady. Yeah, they done, they... They grew everything. Everything they needed to survive on, they grew it. And had a cellar? Had a cellar. It was right out the back door handy so they could just carry the fruit down there. And it was built, special built, with shells built in the concrete so they could store the stuff. So I'm taking, <coughs> I'm under, if I understand you correctly, part of the original house is still? We're sitting uh, in the original sitting, house. It was okay. built in 1966 just been updated along the way yeah this room and that one in there are the originals there was a hall right here there was a fireplace right into this room fireplace into that room and this hall went into this there was two original rooms and later on they added the one room and the hall went into it uh where the kitchen was or that original one i don't know but uh my grand <coughs> In 1916, my grandfather decided that this house, the, the, let me back up a little bit. The road from Claremore to Tahlequah come by the house and went down the west side here. The house faced that road. 
Everybody wanted to face the road in them days, I guess. And still do. The houses are built facing the street and whatever. But anyway, they changed the road that went by the north side of the house and on down there. So he turned this house around in 1916. So the watch people go by, I guess. <laughs> I don't know of any other reason. <laughs> But anyway, uh, my uncle said they turned this thing around. An old man named Cab Benton turned it around with a team of horses. And uh, they got done on New Year's Eve, or Christmas Eve. And he said a blue northern blew in, and there wasn't a door on his house that shut. They like froze, had quilts nailed over every door. And, of course, the fireplaces was tore out. And uh, they was kind of a heck of a mess, but they survived. It can't, it can be hardy, I guess. Oh, yeah. Well, after my granddad turned the house around, uh, of course, he died in 1917, about a year later. But they started them two rooms on the back, back there, uh, before he died, but it was finished up later. And that was the main part of the house. And it was heated by wood? Heated by, heated by wood and cooked by wood. <clears throat> and what was the the water source? Where where they get their water? There was an old spring down here by the creek. It was dug out, and they carried water from there. But then when they could afford it, they finally, uh, that's where the Joseph Ann family got their water. And my grandfather did too when they first moved here. But he finally dug a 30-foot dug well right straight behind the house, right outside the kitchen. And they had, the, of course, a wall up around it and one of the windlasses to pull the bucket out of there. Some of the memories I've got of that was they would put a half a gallon of milk on a string and rope and drop it down in there to keep it cool. And once in a while, that thing would get broke. And we had milky water for a while. <laughs> well, I, I can remember that pretty plain. And I can remember going out there and drawing that water. Of course, all the wash water and everything had to be drawn out and, that well. And probably had an outhouse at that time. And yeah. Uh, the, uh, my dad finally put a, a pump in there, a hand pump to pump water. And then later on, bought a, we got electric 1949, and he bought a pump jack to put on it, which would pump the water without having to, you have to do any manual labor, but it was, still wasn't piped in the house. And then later on, they, they got it in here about, I don't know what year that was, but it was a long time before. Uh, what was your question? No. Oh, the outhouse? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, Talk about the buildings outside. The smokehouse is still out there, the original smokehouse. I've redone it and made a storage building out of it. The chicken house, the hen house for the for the eggs and stuff was right right out there. Uh, and the two hole toilet was it hid the two hole toilet. It was on the back side. It's <laughs> a two seater, huh? It's a two seater, yeah. <laughs> Later on we had a single seater out here. Moving on up. <laughs> There's a WPA belt toilet. I mean, it was cord to spec. Okay. <laughs> We've had a few people tell us about that, but not many, so that's good to know. Yeah, and I, yeah they were they were same way with the Bruder House. My mom built a Bruder House, and they built it to specs of the OSU extension. Furnished all that information back then. Okay, that's good to know, too. Uh, so, uh, anyway, she had a Bruder House out there that, She'd order 150 baby chicks through the post office and the mail carrier would deliver them or we'd go pick them up. Now I've got two houses out there, uh, 400 foot long, 40 foot wide, 16,000 square feet in each of them that hold 40,000 birds. I grow, I'm a contract grower for Tyson. So still doing chickens. Just still doing chickens. <laughs> well, did your mother uh, belong to a homemaker club then? Yeah. It Nettie Sites, I believe, was the home demonstration agent, and they had uh, the community would have, well, all the ladies in the community would get together on a regular basis for a home demonstration uh, program or some sort. Happen to remember the name of the group? Uh, no, I really don't, but I remember Nettie Sites was the... That's, that's pretty good. Yeah, I don't remember exactly what the... What about the county agent, the ag, the ag agent? Uh, Harold Nelson. Mm -hmm. Harold Nelson. 
Well, he came down here and helped my dad uh, graft pecan trees and do terracing and that kind of type of thing. Were you in 4-H yourself? No, I was in uh, FFA for four years. I was a junior master farmer. So you participated in county fairs then? Yeah. Uh, Mays County Fair, when the old fair ground was north of town, nothing but a pile of junk. They got a nice one now, but that was in the 50s, 51 through 55, when I was in the fair, uh, showing hogs. I showed hogs, Hampshire hogs. We went from there to Muskogee Free State Fair, and it was a big fair at that time, and then on to Tulsa State Fair. So you went to high school here in Locust, Locust Grove. Grove. I went to grade school in Cave Springs, a mile west of me here, an old country school. And how, many, how many were you in your class? About seven. Was it one through eight? Or the, the... Well, they had two, it was a two-room schoolhouse. had one through four in one room and, and the fifth through the eighth in the next one. So then we graduated and went to Locust Grove, big town. <laughs> And about how many kids were in your the graduating class as a senior? Uh, 36, I believe it was. Well, that's pretty decent. It's grown a lot since then. And what year was that that you graduated? 55. 55. My dad had about seven or eight in his class, 1926, when he graduated. Did Him he? and my mother both went to this K Spring School, too. Is the building still standing for it? They made a home out of it, and you can't tell. The only thing is... Noticeable now is the cellar. The cellar's still there, of course. And how would you get to school? Well, most of the time we walked. Uh, yeah, sometimes did. an old man by the name of Bill Breedlove drove the bus from Locust, or for Locust Grove. He lived way down Yonkers, about 20 miles down there, I think. But anyway, he'd let us ride the bus any time we needed to. It was raining or something like that, we could ride it. Then later on, we got ride a horse to school, later on drive a little Ford tractor. A tractor? <laughs> a little Ford tractor, yeah. <laughs> Me and my friends up the road here, Graham and Pete Bates, we'd race them things. They had one too. We'd race them to school or up and down the road. We was a little mischief, mischievous back then. Oh, well, tell us a little bit about more about that then. What else did you do mischievous? Oh, well. For fun. I, I can't think fun. of anything. Well, I'll just say this, we didn't have a lot of things to play with. I did when I was a little kid. I've got pictures of boy, bright new toys and stuff out there on top of the cellar. And uh, they'd be worth two or three hundred dollars a piece if I had them now. I don't know what happened to them. New tricycle? Grandma probably bought all of them, I would assume. But anyway, later on, grew up, didn't have nothing. We had a, we call it a bean flip, shoot birds and stuff with. And, the Ross boys, neighbor boys around here, we'd all get together, go off down the creek, stay all day, knocking wasp nests, walking up and down the creek, getting into anything we could. <laughs> stay all day. I guess folks never did worry about it. Yeah. Shoot snakes. Of course, we'd be barefooted all that time. Mm. But the, the bee stings. Well, we, we grew up. <laughs> Kids nowadays, you got their cell phones and Texting, that's all I got to do. I know. Sad, isn't it? It is. I'll never get into the texting, I don't guess. I do use the phone. Well, I'm assuming you had chores assigned to you around the farm? Oh, yeah. Uh, the main thing we done was uh, my dad put a dairy in about 48 or somewhere along in there. And we started out in one of the cow lots down there, and all we had was about three or four number three war stubs sitting out there and we throw the feed in them and the old cows hopefully would stand still long enough to get them milk. We usually did. Then later on, uh, Pet Milk Company came along and talked him into buying some more cows and selling the pet. And uh, we done that for a while, cooled it in a half barrel with water in it. That's all the cooling it got before they picked it up. Then Medigold come along and decided that we ought to go grade A. And they furnished, I think they loaned my dad money to buy cows with and take it out of the check, you know. I think a lot of the dairies, there's a lot of dairies started up about that time, early 50s or late 40s. 
But anyway, we uh, added on to the, the old original barn down here. Uh, added the shed onto it and uh, put stanchions in there. And we milked it in there by hand, poured it in a milk can. And uh, the truck had come around and pick it up. Well, I graduated from high school and left. And uh, he put in a uh, vacuum tank or vacuum milkers. But they still had to port the can. Well, my brother graduated and left. Then he got a vacuum tank. <laughs> Every time somebody left, well, he'd add better equipment. <laughs> and so uh, that's they finally wound up with that. And uh, as long as they milked, of course, my mother and my uncle they was uh, helped us milk too. There's four of us milked. Uh, most of the men, but mom would do a lot of the milking too. Uh, I, we had an uncle that lived here. I had two daddies when I grew up. <laughs> uh, when my dad uh, inherited the place, well, my uncle had lived here all his life. So he stayed here too. So we grew up, me and my brother, and I had a little sister uh, with two daddies, mm -hmm. so to speak, you know. He helped us a lot. Didn't have to have any hired help then if you had well uh yeah we did uh my uncle would uh, he had a place down here uh south here about a half of a mile and uh but our we used a lot of the our cherokee neighbors around here most of our neighbors were cherokees but they would come and work for us and way back there i guess 50 cents a day and it finally got up to five dollars i think and uh, that was high pay <laughs> But uh, a lot of them, uh, there was an Indian lady who used to come here that would help mom and them when this cannon and hog killing and all that. And uh, she just worked for food, anything to eat. Yeah, she had a big family and didn't have a husband that helped her much. Yes, <laughs> so your, your, your dad did dairy. Did he have a job off the farm? He, he, during the war, he worked at a fire station over at the old Oklahoma Ordnance Works near Pryor, where the industrial area is now. They had a German uh, prisoner camp, prisoner war camp over there, and had a fire station there by it. Uh, he worked there some, and then, uh, oh, later on he worked, in his later years he worked in Tulsa sometimes at the field hire building. But most of the time he... Uh, he farmed. Made most of his money income was from farming then? Yeah, like from the most part, dairy. From the yeah. Most, yeah, most of our income was always from from the farm. But he, in uh, 1948, he bought an old, uh, we had, God, we had mules, corral full of mules and horses down there, the teams, you know, to work with, wagons and all the horse-drawn equipment you can think of. 1948, he bought an old F-30 farm all tractor. And boy, that was something. He was proud of that. Got the drawing equipment to go with it. New? Uh -huh. Was it new or used? Oh, no, it was used. It was used then. That was probably 1920 model or early 30s or something like that. But anyway, he got to farming with that, and it wasn't long till the, we didn't use horses or anything except to ride. Then in uh, 48, yeah, 48 or 9, he bought a little 8 in Ford tractor. And, oh, that was mine. <laughs> I helped him farm with that. And use it for every other thing. That's the one I was taking, talking about running school with. But, uh, I said, we talked about these outbuildings. Mm -hmm. I think we covered all of them here. Uh, the barn, the original barn down there was built by Joseph Van back 1829, 30, somewhere along in there, right after he came here, and it was all logs, and probably built by slaves. And, uh, of course, they used it when they came here, but in 1928, they built that new barn that you can see down there. The main part of the barn was new in 1928. Of course, the sheds have been added on to it later. Uh, I don't know what happened to the old barn. Uh, probably rotted down. I got a good picture of it anyway. Uh, 
I had a granary out north of it, put corn and stuff in, and there was another granary uh, of Joseph Vans down there, a two-room granary that they used for years, and it finally got burnt down. Uh, the new barn had four double stalls. You could put eight horses or mules in there, feed them at a feed trough, plumb across that one side of it, and uh, of course had a 40-ton hayloft. And the mangers or hay racks were built along top of that main uh, the feed trough. And I still left part of the feed trough and the mangers in there, so some of the people down through the years can see how that was built. But anyway, you get it and loft throw the hay down in there. You didn't have to take it anywhere else. Feed the horses right there. Then there was two granaries and a saddle room or tack room in the new barn. Do you have any favorite stories of, of things that happened in the barn? Yeah. Of course, we played down there. That's another thing. We that we played down there to have something to do. <clears throat> Climbing up that old loft and playing up in the hay. Of course, I thought I was helping them put hay in there, too, when they bring it. <laughs> uh, but I can remember climbing. It's got two ladders, one in the back and one in the front. I climbed up that ladder one day out of all stummy right on the end of the nose. And... Uh, my eyes would swell shut before I could get to the house screaming and squalling. <laughs> I thought I'd run. But, uh, and I used to dream about being down there playing. We always had cattle around here, and white faced bulls with horns. And I'd dream about them bulls chasing me, and I'd just barely make it to that ladder. <laughs> just barely get out of the way. Never did that one chase me, but I'd dream about it. Well, they were bigger than you at that time. Oh, little, maybe. yeah. Uh, <laughs> another thing we done down there was a lot of little, little uh, wood bees, carpenter bees, they call them. Of course, we'd get a paddle and try to kill them. That was another pastime. We'd do that for hours. Uh, well, when you got stung on the nose, did the, how did they treat or was there any treatment? You know, I probably put coal oil on it. <laughs> that was the main thing we doctored with then. You step on a nail when you come to the house and grandma put a piece of fat meat, salt pork meat, turp and kerosene on it, or coal oil we call it, wrap it up. And that it, took care and of that. It worked, you, and it worked. Didn't worry about no tetanus shot. It worked, yeah. You can feel it going to work right immediately. Just drawing that out of there. I know some people use tobacco juice on bee stings. So. Yeah. Uh, but not everybody. I don't know that. if they, they chewed. Back then, smoked too. I don't remember ever doing that, but kerosene was the main thing. If you cut yourself or anything, kerosene. When I went to work public service company, the first thing we done was had first aid classes, and I told them how we doctor stuff. Oh my God, they like to the blew up. So that's poison. <laughs> so anyway, I shut up about that. I didn't talk about it anymore. I didn't ever know anybody got hurt or died from it, but they said it was terrible. Well, let's back up a bit then. Since when you graduated from high school, then what did you do? Let's go through your career. Uh, when I graduated, I went, there was a, uh, a county agent from here out in west of Ponca City. And I don't remember what, it might have been Pawnee County. Is, Pon west of Ponca City, anyway. That's K County's Ponca And. Uh, he kind of got me and one of his nephews to go out there and work on some farms. And I thought, boy, that's a, quite a deal. And I went out there. I don't think there was a tree anywhere around there. And I was kept, uh, stayed with an old couple there. Probably wasn't all that old, but I thought he was at that time. And they put me on a tractor for morning, and I'd stay out there all day long. I think them fields are big. I'd never seen fields that big before. Just... So about a month of that's all I could handle. I got homesick, away from my girlfriend. It was terrible. <laughs> and they were real nice people. We just didn't have nothing to talk about. And uh, so I got back and uh, went to work for my cousin over in Tulsa, Phillips Transfer Company, moving pianos and appliances and all that kind of stuff for about a year. And then a friend of mine here at Locust Grove worked for a public service company. He was a service man here. He said there's going to be a opening for a meter reader uh, at Shodo. 
want me to apply for it. And this job paid 195. Uh, so I said, well, I can't live on that. My daddy-in-law at the time said, well, go ahead and take it. I think it'd be good for you to take it, and I'll help you till you get on your feet. Well, I took it and uh, stayed there 38 years. Started out as a meter reader, uh, company rep, service rep, and went into the line construction, part of public service company, and... <clears throat> Wound up as construction superintendent over the whole thing in Tulsa, in Tulsa. And when did, when did you retire? 94, 1994, 56 years old. Well, was that about the time you took <clears throat> over running the farm, or had you been doing that all along? Me? Uh -huh. No, uh, <clears throat> I came, <clears throat> excuse me, I came back and, uh, let's see, well, I had been here about four years, I guess, before I retired, but that, uh, uh, my mother died in 91, I believe it was. I'd lived here about four years, and uh, of course just messed with Heidi, and I had some steers, run some steers and what have you. But uh, then when I retired, well, uh, worked for a contractor for two years, and then somebody around here was building a chicken house, and I asked about it and wound up with two of them. So I'm still farming. You're not retired yet, then. <laughs> I'm not retired yet. <laughs> I... Uh, I had full retirement at 56 years old. I had enough years in. And they also give me what they call an enhanced retirement. They paid me the same thing Social Security would pay me, but I was 62. So I drawed that up until I was 62, and then Social Security took over. It's hard to say no to that, wasn't uh, it? Yeah. I, they was wanting to get rid of several people, you know, cut down, cut back. So there's a lot of us retired, and a lot of people jumped on that. Well, how many children do you have? I have uh, three, and my wife has uh, four. So we've got seven between us. Well, uh, those... This is not my first wife. Lee's not my first wife. Well, of these, of these children, are any of them planning to be move right in and take over the farm later? I've got one that thinks he wants to. <laughs> they all want a part of it, but uh, I don't know if that'll ever work out or not. I don't, I imagine it'll be divided, uh, sold and divided up. That's the way I see it, you know, to be honest about it. You just let them deal with it later. Uh -huh. They can deal with that part later. Yeah, yeah, they can deal with that to their own satisfaction, I guess. Okay. So aren't any of them farming? The no, my uh, youngest son has been helping me until he, he got a, another job. I've got one 53 and a daughter... 50 and one 23. So one's younger. <laughs> Keeps you young. He's, uh, he's the one that thinks he wants to take over the poultry business. Huh? And he may. You know, I don't. I just don't know. Well, what does that entail, the, the, the poultry business? What all do you have to do for that? Well, it's just, it's a daily thing, kind of like a dairy. You, you're tied down. For seven weeks is what it takes to grow them, and then you're off about 10 days, but you're spending all that time getting ready for the next bunch. Hmm. And, uh, so you spend the so, whole year rotating like that? Yeah, That's yeah. You... One year you'll have six flocks, next year you'll have five. And they come to pick them up, or do you have to deliver? No, they come and get them. They bring them, and bring them on a, a semi-truck. When I first started, brought them on a school bus. <laughs> now they Got a big air conditioned semi truck, and then when they come and pick them up, they bring uh, about eight or ten catchers. That, that's all they do is catch chickens and uh, forklifts and the big trucks with the coops and everything. Oh, they do that. All I got to do is get the equipment up out of the way. Everything cranks up in the chicken house out of the way, cranks up to the ceiling. Technology is great for that. Oh, yeah. Guess. Computers to run the thing. Of course, you got to make sure the computers are working all the time, too. <laughs> well, and then if, they, if you don't have electricity, does that impact what's going on out there? Well, yeah, but I have a backup generator. Okay, so you've yeah. got that covered. you got to have a backup generator because it, it automatically starts. If I ain't here, it goes. Hmm. Oh. Yeah, you'd uh, 
we just suffocate a whole flock of chickens. Well, I know there's the byproduct. What do you at the? What do you do with the the litter? Mm -hmm. I sell it. I I have used it, but I've almost got to the max on it now, so uh, you can sell it easily. Uh, there's a real demand for it. A long way from a dairy farm, though. It, I mean, you learn oh, different things. It's a whole different yeah, setup. Yeah. Yeah, you get, uh, the letter used to be a problem, but now they such a demand for it. The contractors, the contractor come in clean your house. I don't charge you nothing for that, and then pay you so much for the letter. And some of mine went to Weatherford, Oklahoma. Hmm. About all of it's getting hauled out of the watershed district. So uh, that, that's good. That's you good. know, that's, that's getting hauled out, of course. We've all got the federal regulations, state regulations we go by anymore. Uh, so everything's pretty well regulated. I know there's a lot of resentment or people that don't like chicken farming, but hog farming the same way. You know, people, we got to produce food, but people don't want to worry about their drinking water and all that. And that, they shouldn't have to worry about it. You know, if we do our part, well, they don't have to worry about it. It has been abused in the past, I'm sure. Well, when your dad was running the dairy, did he have to deal with federal regulations, or that was early, too early on? I don't think there was federal regulation, but there's state health, state health regulations. That you, there was an inspector come around every, every thirty days at least, at random. Well, how, how did your father keep records, of it, or did he? Uh Oh, they jotted a lot of things down in, uh, in books. I've got some old records out there where they used to keep track of the cattle and the cattle brands and whether they belonged to my uncle or my dad or my grandmother or another uncle. They, I've got all the cattle brands out there I'll show you after a while okay. that was on this place. And i still got all the branding orange. <laughs> but anyway, uh, of course, he... Probably throw all his records in a cigar box or something till tax time, and uh, then dug them out. And that's I do file mine, but I don't. Uh, then I dig them all out, and go through them at tax time. But I, I noticed uh, on our, I don't. Uh, I don't really keep a lot of records. I keep all my settlement papers and everything on my on my birds that are growing where they paid me and and uh, all that. Uh, like I've, I've laughed a lot of times. Uh, bus, my wife is a stickler for checkbook balance all the time. <laughs> I ain't never balanced a checkbook. I always I tell her I you keep it down for that money in there. You don't have to worry about it and. My bank's real nice. If I overdraw, they'll call me. <laughs> so, let, let them do the bookkeeping. I don't keep books. I'm not a detailed person in that area. I'm, I'm very seldom ever even looking at a statement. If I want to know something, how much I got, I call. Well, got that sale for them right there. You know, they, they let you know. Well, Let's talk about the farm a little bit more too. Were how many ponds are on the property, or are there any? I know there's one out here. I uh, my dad uh, built one. Uh, there are a couple up north of here, and both of them were uh, soil conservation ponds built where they picked they picked the spot and everything. You know, uh, there was two up there, and then I built these two. I built, well, I built three. One of them's on my brother down there, but there's three different ponds here on this creek probably 15, 20 years ago. I bought an old dozer and I played around and, and built them dams. <laughs> and, uh, boy, we got nice bass down there. My boy caught a nine and a quarter pounder this week. And last summer they caught two, two seven pounders, but they catch a lot of bass, but them, they love them, them big ones. And there's some nice ones down there. Do you stock them? Stock them or? I did when I first built the ponds. Well, not since. I uh, have, have no, I haven't since. stocked them since, but them bass has really took over. I stocked 
China cat down there too, but nobody's ever caught one. I put 200 of them in there. Uh, never put crappie in there yet. I should. I keep planning on it, but I haven't. Well, that's fun. Do you swim in the ponds? What did you no, swim? Did you swim in them? Fishing's all they do. Well, when you were younger, did you no, swim the them? ponds weren't there then. Uh, the the creek, the two creeks run together down here, and they go on down running in Spring Creek, and that's we played up and down that creek all the time. Went on down to Spring Creek where the swimming holes was. Okay. This little <laughs> creek never did have enough water in it for a swimming hole. Wade. Well, the two that the soil conservation built was probably more for cattle too. Yeah, was, they were was for it, cattle. Was it for playing? Yeah, they were, they were for cattle. Well, when you were younger, what was? How did they do bath time? Did you have a number two tub or? or oh, no, we had a number did, three tub. Now number, I remember that. Okay. And uh, in the winter time. Mom and heat water and put that old tub. Me and Jim take a bath in it. I don't know where we got in it, but we did. I couldn't now. <laughs> My dad couldn't get out. Well, anyway, uh, I remember uh, bath water sitting there, and the next morning it'd be froze. You know, in a cold, cold winter time. And we took a bath about once a week. We didn't take bath every day like we do now. That was a sweet deal. Mom and Dad, they'd done the same thing, my uncle. Uh, summertime, we'd uh, set that old tub out there on the walk in the back by the cellar and the well, and uh, Mom would draw water put in it, and the sun would heat it, and we'd have a good warm bath. Who got to go first? Well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't worry about for who was first or second of them days. Now, the old cellar house is where Mom doesn't had. Uh, first, she had a pot out there in the yard. She washed out there in the yard on her, in her wash pot. Uh, built a fire under it, heated the water and everything. But later on, well, they still heated the water in it, but they carried put it in an old Speed Queen washing machine Daddy bought. And she'd go out there and stomp on that thing all morning trying to get it to start. And it, then it had flexible holes stick out the door so she wouldn't suffocate from fumes. But anyway, she'd wash out there, get the washing all done. Well, that was another time we took a bath. It was in the bluing water. It was the cleanest. <laughs> <laughs> We'd go out there and take a bath. It's, it's amazing how people live back then. Well, it's interesting, though. You know, they, yeah, I know it. It's, I tell them stories of some of that stuff I shouldn't tell, but that's the way it was. Well, what would she usually fix for breakfast? Oh, they never was such a thing as a bowl of cereal. Back in them days, we had uh, sausage, biscuits and gravy, or bacon, or call it tenderloin then, or uh, ham. Oh, we cured all our hams and everything out there. We have that old ham, red eye gravy, maybe a bowl of rice, bowl of oatmeal. It looked like you feed the army. They had everything in the world, wasn't it? Well, did she make her own sausage? Yeah, my dad made the sausage. Mm -hmm. That when we butchered. Usually in December we butchered. So we killed about eight, eight or ten hogs. Did they ever can the meat? I've heard people talk about uh, canning. They they killed a beef one time before it got electricity and everything and thought they'd can it and that turned out to be disastrous. Everything was roast beef and yeah. I think they finally threw most of it away. But uh, and then when they got a freezer, well, they started the butchering the beef. Most of all of ours was pork because you could cure it. Smoke in the smokehouse? You actually yeah, had a smokehouse. Smoke I remember them stuffing up all, stopping up all the cracks and cutting green hickory wood and building two or three little fires in the floor and have all them hams and stuff hanging up. Smoke it. That's the best smelling stuff in the world. Of course, it salted it all down before and salt out there. Done all that. Was anything uh, traditionally done for holidays like Christmas or July 4th or anything like that? Uh, back then, uh, uh, We'd start out, I guess, uh, maybe Mother's Day. 
celebrated that. Uh, everybody, all the kin folks come and went to church. And uh, and then, uh, see, Memorial Day, everybody came for decoration. We got our own cemetery out here, family cemetery. And uh, so they'd go there and to Hogan, and then there's a Markham Cemetery over here that was my grandmother's family. So that's a family cemetery, too. Uh, after Memorial Day, I guess it would be... Uh, Fourth of July, we'd get together and go to the creek down here on Spring Creek, and big group, big family group, everybody went. Then uh, didn't do nothing Labor Day, uh, Thanksgiving. Oh, that was the next big one. Everybody come to that. Did Christmas the same way came here to this? Well, most of the time it came here, but I had an uncle lived in Tulsa, and sometimes we would go over there and, and have the Christmas over there instead of here. Therefore, we had Thanksgiving here when we didn't have Christmas over there. Got to share the trip. Cut a tree from the farm, or? Oh, yeah. Uh, I remember when I was a little old kid, we never did buy trees when I was growing up. We'd go, me and my mom would go down here, there's cedar trees all up and down this old creek. And we'd go down there and pick out one we thought was the prettiest thing there was, bring it back and put it down. <laughs> By the time Christmas got here, the limbs were all hanging down, the green was dry, and of course, well, that was the best we had. We thought that was the greatest thing in the world. Make all the chains and stuff. Mom would get the red berries and string them on a string and decorate the tree. And somewhere back, well, we finally got electricity. She bought some of them bubble lights that bubbled and put, uh, put on them trees. But we thought that was so. They are still pretty cool. Yeah, uh, they're antiques now if you can find them. Yeah. Kind of look like candles. Uh, we always uh, cut our own tree down here. Well, in the days when you were heating with wood, would it be cold when you got up in the morning, like in the winter time? Would yeah, we never kept a fire overnight. When we went to bed, the fire went out. You know, if it went out during the night, Dad'd get up next morning, and about five o'clock. Come in here and start stoking that stove up, pour some kerosene in it, and get her to go. And uh, then I'd get out, I'd wait a while till it got warmed up a little bit. And then uh, we had to get up early to go milk, you know, so I'd finally get up. Boy, I remember crawling out from all them covers, and we had, we had comforters, tack, big old heavy tack quilts. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we had feather beds. But we'd be nestled down and out them comforters over to stay warm. Get up in the morning. We didn't have carpet then. Linoleum floors. Boy, it's like walking on ice. <laughs> I'm telling you. Grandma did make some throw rugs. Hook hook rugs, I guess they call it. Mm -hmm. Different materials sewed together. But anyway, we'd try to step on them. They, they were scattered through the house. And we'd try to step on them, stay off that damn if it was cold. <laughs> Come in here and crowd around that stove. And it, I don't remember it ever heating the house plumb up. You usually had to get around the stove, stay warm or pretty close to it, you know. We didn't run around in our underwear back then. Either. We wore clothes and get, you put a coat on if we wanted to. Get dressed didn't. in a hurry, huh? That's right. Didn't tear it around. <laughs> Well, the, the farm had to have made it survive pretty well through the 1930s. Uh, well, I think my grandmother lost most of her money in the bank. I don't know how much she had, but we never done without anything because we raised all of our food. Whatever. It was, it was rough times for them, but uh, they raised most of the food. Didn't buy, just staples is all they buy, flour or something like that, you know. Well, and then the 50s was another rough time for, for, yeah, for farming. Yeah, uh, but I don't remember it being too severe. 
And then the 80s were tough. What about? Well, I don't remember that being sure either. Uh, back in the in that depression, we was talking about land a while ago. This land was always free range unless the owner fenced it. So your cattle could run anywhere they wanted to. Our cattle run to pegs, yonkers, uh, halfway to sliding, plumb out to rows, anywhere they wanted to. Uh, but what I was going to say, during the Depression, a lot of farmers just left. And uh, this land could be bought for taxes. A lot of it was just available for taxes because that just went off and didn't pay the taxes. But uh, my uncle Toby said we could have had all the land we wanted. But said, hell, we didn't need to buy it. We used it anyway. You know, yeah. cattle is running, cattle and horses and hogs all run outside. Well, how, how would you round them up then? Well, the cattle, uh, they would drive them in. The hogs, you'd go down with some corn and they'd follow you in. Uh, but you had to make sure they were yours. Well, yeah. But if somebody else didn't claim them, I guess it was yours. <laughs> but the hogs was marked just like cattle were. Oh, were they branded too? No, they wasn't branded. But they split their ears. Hmm. Yeah, they'd have splits in their ears. Well, that's one way they marked hogs. Now, the cattle were all branded. And everybody had their own brand. Um, some of them registered them, some of them didn't. I don't think any of ours was ever registered. But anyway, uh, they branded the cattle, and then they marked their ears with either under, they call it underslope, they'd bite, slice off the bottom of the ear, or they'd split the end of the ear, right ear, the, left, you know, the owner may have used the left ear, and they'd brand on the hip usually. So the neighbors had to agree on the, the signage for the no, ear, you, for the ears? No, you then. marked yours however you wanted to. And then put your brand on there, too. So there's a combination of things there that okay. identifies yours. You put your brand on there. That was the main thing. But for the pigs? For the pigs, uh, I don't know if they ever got mixed up. Ours, you know, there wasn't nobody around close to us, so I don't know. Uh, they probably want, don't wander as much as a cow would. Not as far. Uh, okay. But them cattle, they were all branded and marked and uh, what have you. That, that was uh, probably my... That and thrashing time was my favorite times on the farm. Really? Routed up them cattle. Of course, I've helped gather the cattle a lot of times. Uh, and my uncle, he rode all the horse all the time, checking on these cattle. He knew every other cows, the old lead cow to have a bell on. Everybody's bell was different. He knew everybody's sound, whose cattle they were, when he heard them. Interesting. He knew his when he heard them, you know, and and he knew by what they was going to be, watering holes and the pastures they'd go to, and go, well, he stayed on top of it all the time. So the lead cow, the other cows follow. I yeah, take, I yeah, take it. Yeah, the group would be with the lead cow. They call her the lead cow, or bell cow. Hmm. A little smarter than you think, then maybe. Oh yeah, they. Uh, there's always a boss cow in the herd. Well, you always see groups of them, so you figure they're at least social beings. Yeah. I mean, they like being around other ones. Where would you Where would you have to take them to market? Tulsa or well, a lot of times uh, the steers would. Uh, back then, you kept cattle two or three years instead of selling them when they was less than a year old. Uh, but the cattle buyers would come here. Would of course, corral the cattle and then some way or another get a hold of them and tell them we had them corralled and they'd come here and make an offer for them. And uh, of course, he's always getting beat that way. Nobody, well, no competition. Later on, uh, they had a little sale barn up here at Locust and they take them up there and that's competitive bidding. Uh, then they went to the Tulsa Stockyards after that, hauled them over there and, and that was... Uh, at first, that was private treaty. You had all the commission companies, and you signed your cattle or hogs to a certain commission company, and then they secretly went and got bids from different buyers. 
and uh, that's the way it was handled. Uh, I'd go over with them sometimes, and while I was waiting for them to get sold and what have we'd go to the Malt Brothers Saddle Company and cafe right next to it. That's the first time I ever eat a meal away from home was uh, there's a little cafe there at the stockyards. And then we go to Malt Brothers and uh, look at saddles and all that kind of stuff, kill time. But then later, uh, of course, the Tulsa Stockyards went out of business over there, Sand Springs, and they built the new stockyards on the east side of town. Still call it Tulsa Cow Palace, what I think they called it. But anyway, you just run them in there and it was competitive bidding. Hmm. So that's the way, it, a lot of cattle, or not a lot of ours, uh, were shipped. They had an old stockyard here at Locust, and some of the cattle were shipped out on that. But the big cattleman, my uh, uh, Walter Markham, who was my grandmother's brother, was a big rancher. His place is west of town there. They drove the cattle to Shoto, pinned them over there, and shipped them to Kansas City. By train or? Yeah, by train. By train. Yeah, they had a stockyard right there by the tracks, and they'd load them up right on there. Call them to Kansas City. My uncle said they'd take a pack to lunch, him and his uncle, ride in the cattle car to Kansas City, stay, stay all night, watch the cattle sell, get the money, come back home. Could I've got correspondence between him and the commission companies up there of shrinkage and different problems with the cattle, you know and uh, uh, letters he wrote, and they wrote back to him mm. at Mark, Oklahoma, which was back before Locust Grove was founded. Well, ha has Locust Grove changed much? Oh, since, yeah. Since, uh, did it have a theater back in the day? I'm doing a lot of research right now on that, getting ready for the centennial next year, 2012. Uh, yeah, Locust Grove had a post office up towards Salina. Started out just Locust Grove post office. Then it moved on down to the Jerry Kells farm, which is north of Locust. And in the meantime, there was a Mark, Oklahoma, which was just west west of Locust, about two miles. That my grandfather named after my grand or my grandmother's brother, Walter or C. D. Markham. And uh, there was a little town out there. Well, in 1912, O.W. Killam had bought locusts, bought the land up here, and was started a town, found another town. Of course, there's some businesses already there, but then Mark moved in there too. They, they kind of joined together there. Mm. And the uh, railroad had come in there, the K.O. and G. And uh, that was a big deal. Of course, the town was founded on the railroad tracks back then, more or less. Don't think there was a highway of any kind at that particular time. However, I've discovered there was a what they call White River White River Trail that came through Locust. Then it turned into Highway 11, State Highway 11. Then it was State Highway 33, and now it's uh, 412. Yes, 412. <laughs> so that's the change in the highways. But uh, Main Street and Locust Grove used to be north and south. And I'll show you some of the old buildings after a while. Uh, but when the highway come in, well, it moved down to the highway. And that was the main part of town right now. And, uh, of course, when the turnpike came in, everything's moving out that way now. And they got a lot of empty buildings downtown. But it has changed over the years quite a bit. Uh, like the theater, he said. My dad told me about a theater uh, that he went to when he was a kid. S silent movies. You had to read pretty things. But, well, my granddad, Hal, my mother's dad, had a cream station there in town. Produce and eggs and bulk cream and all that kind of stuff. And I thought that old building looked kind of strange, but nobody ever said anything about it. And later on, I found out that was a Broadway theater. That, that my dad had been talking about. Hmm. Of course, it's gone now, but anyway, there was a theater right there at the stoplight, the Grand Theater, that I went to show at 10 cents a white, 
back now as a kid. I think it's 20 after you got 16 or something like that, or adults. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was the entertainment on Saturday night. All the families around this country went to town and parked on the street. They might have went and got their groceries during the day, but they come back to town on Saturday night. Kids go to the show. All the folks visit up and down the sidewalk with each other. Uh, that kind of thing, you know. And uh, maybe everything would break up 10, 30, 11 o'clock, everybody go home. <laughs> but it was a social deal Saturday nights for us. And when did that start to change, to uh, rough, roughly? Probably the late 50s or 60s, mm -hmm. early 60s. When TV came in, I bet. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was one of those. We got our electricity here in 49. Of course, we didn't get a TV for a while. Our entertainment before we got that TV was... Uh, no battery radio. Me and my uncle would sit and listen to the Grand Ole Opry on Saturday night, or try to. <laughs> All the static and everything else. But man, it was the best we had. We hadn't heard anything better, so, you know, you didn't think anything about it. Good old days. Good old days. Enjoyed every bit of it. <laughs> I wasn't going to do it again, but uh, I don't have no regrets. I'm glad I, li I lived through that and can appreciate how things are now. Well, do you have any theories on, on how you, how your family has decided to keep the land as long as they have? I mean, what has contributed to that, to keeping in the family along the way? Well, uh, of course, they've got deep roots, the same as I had. Uh, they had kept this land all that time and, and through the Depression and all kind of hard times. And... Uh, you know, what else was they going to do? It was more or less, this was it. You know, they was damn lucky to have what they had. And they took care of it. And my dad, he would have never thought about getting rid of it. And of course, he passed it on down to me and Jim. And uh, we both uh, got deep roots. Was there ever a, a, an equipment shop? I mean, something broke down. How would you fix it? Uh, well, I don't know how my granddad fixed it, but my dad would drag it under one of these big pecan trees down here and put a chain around a limb up there to thing and find a come along of some kind to pick pick up whatever he was working on and worked out there under the shade. Drug what ranches he had down there, and that's why he done it. Uh, he never had a loader tractor on the place to pick up anything. I don't know how he got by without it. Me and my brother both got them and they use them every day. You know, that's just, hell, you couldn't get by without one. But anyway, that's why he worked on things. Uh, very seldom ever took anything to town to get it worked on. He'd try to do it here. I remember he'd have hay down and all of his equipment broke down and his hay burning up out there in the field. And, you know, you just didn't worry about it. You just got it when you could. That kind of thing, you know. Uh, I built a little shop down by my poultry houses where I work on things down there. But my brother Jim does most of our mechanic work, and he's built one fine shop up there. He, he was a, a oh, iron. He worked with iron, uh, cutting and fitting and welding and all that kind of stuff, and, and he's a master at it. And... Uh, he really built him a fine shop. He's got everything in the world in Well, let's talk a little bit about him, too, then, because okay. he, his part of his land was also part of yeah. the original. So, I mean, anything, what's what's he doing with his land at this point? What? He's, uh, he runs uh, Angus cattle. He's got about 65 or 70 head of Angus cows, and two or three bulls, and, of course, all of them's got a calf, usually. Uh, and... Uh, on, on his land and mine too. He bailed, I got some hay fields here and he bails them and I let him use my pasture. So he uses the whole thing for cattle, except for in the hay season. Uh, he raises hay and uh, bales hay, contrary, bales hay for others too. He, he stays busy all the time. And he can build anything. 
He'll go to the farm show in Tulsa and see something he thinks he might want and come home and build a thing. A lot better than he's seen, I guarantee you. Hmm. Well, he has he done that all of his life? Yeah, the... he, he spent a lifetime doing that kind of thing. Hmm. The barn that's up there, the big fine barn you look at, uh, he built it, never built one in his life. He built that and it's perfect. Well, how'd he learn to do that? Well... I don't know, but he, he's a perfectionist. And just by doing things, I guess. He yeah. just that He's a couple of years younger than you. He's four years younger than me. Uh he uh I think he passed two grades twice in school. He's pretty sharp. Well, so did he has he always farmed though, or has did he do something and then mm -hmm. come back to it? Well, and he, like me, he worked away from home, uh, different places in Tulsa, in Odessa, Texas. He's they've sent him to Africa to do maintenance on tanks and that type of thing down there. He's but then he, uh, I don't remember what year he came back here and built a hat home up there, and uh, then my dad gave us, but my dad gave him some land to build a house on, and then, uh, of course he inherited the land later. So he's he's been doing both for quite a while. But he chose to come back. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. He's just, like me. He wouldn't go nowhere else. People talk about going here and there, but <clears throat> visiting some other country, that's the least of my worries. <laughs> I've got everything I need right here. And distance-wise between your, where we are now and where he is, it's not very far, a mile maybe, or not even oh, that. Oh, no, not, even it's, that. Uh, not a half a mile, quarter mile. That's the first house up the road there from okay. me. His land place. starts right there on the north side of the barn. Mm -hmm. And so if anything broke down, he fixes it. Yep. Yeah, that ain't no use me. I'm not mechanically minded. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good quality uh, to have for a farmer, that's right. isn't uh, it? I had some equipment around here, and he said, won't you just let me take that up there and use it? If you need anything done, I'll do it. And he does. Well, do you, did you keep your original tractor, the one you were talked about that you drove back and forth to school? Do you still have it? No, I don't. Uh, I had a big auction down here. I've had two big auctions. When my dad died, we had an auction. And uh, I sold it at that auction. Since then, I bought a... A loader tractor, a long loaded loader tractor, and then I've got a uh, Massey Ferguson, the same size of eight in, but it's a Massey Ferguson diesel. And you still have your dozer? No, I bought that old dozer for thirty five hundred dollars and sold it, used it for ten years and sold it for twenty four hundred. Okay. <laughs> now my brother just bought him one, a nice one, and uh, he's planning on doing a lot of, oh, just fixing up. And, Stuff around, you don't have anything really needs to be done, but uh, cosmetics, he said. Playing in the dirt. They're playing in the dirt and fixing the humps and holes and stuff like that. Clearing some of the underbrush and stuff out. Well, do either one of you keep a garden now? Not now. I never have. <clears throat> uh, he he did for a while. <clears throat> but I think he's got so busy now, he ain't got time to mess that garden. Uh, grocery store got everything I need. <laughs> that's some um, something we don't do much anymore. Oh, you know, that's right. Can and uh, all that. We may want to. Uh, excuse me. We may want to talk about the cemetery when you get around to it. Well, go ahead then. Okay. Uh, uh, Joseph Van started the cemetery. They started burying their people there. Uh, I don't remember. When, uh, I believe 1833 from the first. There was two boys buried there that was came here from England to live with Joseph Van, And I don't know just exactly how they were related to him, but anyway, they lived two or three years. They were sick when they got here and they died, and they're buried out there in a, a, a grave house, brick grave house, which was a rich man's grave house at that time. It had a roof on it and the door and everything. Poor man's grave house was logs about three foot high with a little wooden roof on it. I got one of them out there too. But anyway, uh, his wives are buried out there, and some of his children. Uh, uh, his, both of his wives are buried there. Uh, he died in 1877, I told you. And, uh, and then 
family lived here a while and my parents bought the improvements. But uh, all, of, all of the graves out there are related to him in the, the old part of the cemetery. And then the cavalier started burying on the east side, 1900, a little baby. And we've been buried there ever since. The Cavaliers have all been buried right there. My grandma and grandmother, great grandmother, her husband, mom and dad, a little sister. We had a little sister named Marilyn who had heart trouble, born with heart trouble, wasn't supposed to live for six months. And she made it 10 years mm. and uh, died during heart surgery. Back when heart surgery was first started, she, she was too weak for the surgery. So she's buried out there. Well, are there any particular regu regulations that go to having, I mean, do you have to do anything special to get to be buried on your property <clears throat> instead of? Uh, we've never done anything special other than just buried. Hmm. I mean, there are other other cemeteries you have rules you've got to. Oh, I don't know them. what they are. <clears throat> I kept Maybe them. the depth of the grave, but I think they've always dug them six foot deep. All that, uh, but uh, funerals have changed since then. You know, you got vaults and all that kind of stuff. You can almost bury on top of the ground if you want to, I guess. But I think back what that must have looked like when Joseph Van was buried out there, and my granddad of all the buggies and carriages, mm -hmm. horses that would have been out there. Ain't that amazing? It is. I'd like to have a picture or something like that, but I can I can imagine how it was, because they're both real popular people. And how people did they would, pick that spot? I mean, why I why, why, that, why that spot? You know, I don't know why he did it. It was probably a peaceful place for him. Yeah, at that it point. used to be a uh, an old barbed wire fence around it. Of course, for years cattle got in there, some of the stones got broke, and then we finally started taking care of it. Then me and my brother uh, put a chain link fence around it. Around it. We, well, all the whole family donated money. And we put a chain link fence around it and, and fixed it up. And take good care of it now. Uh, so about how many people are buried there, uh, roughly? I believe I've got a count of all. Of, I believe it's forty some. Mm -hmm. And you just look at it, you don't think there's that many, but mm -hmm. there is. Now there's unmarked graves all over that thing. We don't have a clue who they are. Uh, my grandmother came here the same time Joseph Fan did. It was she was his sister. Uh, she married a uh, Robert Weber, and uh, they had Margaret Weber, and that was my grandfather's mother. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, my great grandfather, they was coming back from somewhere down in the southern part of the state, and bushwhackers killed him. My granddad was one year old, sitting in his mother's lap, and his sister was three years old. And they they just made him come on. They didn't ever go back and bury him or nothing. That's the story, you know. Been told. Right. His sister went on and married the Lander, and they all was up around uh, Vanita. So there's a big family of the Landers too. Sally Cavalier was my granddad's sister. Now, outside this cemetery is uh, one of the slaves buried out there, Joseph Van Slave. And his name is New Year's Van. Hmm. And that's the only slave that's buried around here I, that I know of. And I've heard that rumor all my life that, that Grandma said that was New Year's Van's grave. And uh, I'll, we'll sh look at that if you want to. Uh, a lot of rocks piled around there, and of course trees are growing up there now and everything. And I finally put a marker up. Uh, but one day I was down in Muskogee at the library, mm -hmm. and I was looking up some other things, family things, and I run across a freedman of 1866, and I just thought that my, uh, what do they call them, micro film, mm -hmm. and there. And I just about quit looking. I thought I'd see some of the names and stuff in there. And there it was, New Year's Van. I, I thought that name couldn't be possible that somebody was named New Year's Van, but he was. 
Must have been born on New Year's. He was 10 years old. He was just a slave kid. He was 10 years old. In 1866, when they'd done the census, I don't know when he died. But it listed all the other slave names. And mother had to be around somewhere. Well, well maybe, they maybe might not. not have died right then. <clears throat> True. And they could be buried right here somewhere. I don't know. But I know, you know, that he's buried outside the cemetery, not in the cemetery. That's the way blacks were treated back then. But when the slaves were freed, some of them stayed around, you know, at their master's places and what have you. But a lot of them went to different settlements around over the country. And they had a uh, Negro settlement at Murphy, west of Murphy. And they had a cemetery down there, black cemetery. But when they put Fort Gibson Lake in, they had to move those cemeteries because the lake was going to take them. The, all the black graves, they took the Brushy Creek south of Shoto to another black settlement. And they're all reburied over there in that cemetery. Uh, and the whites from down there were buried up here on this mountain here west of me. There was, uh, that was another brother to Joseph Van. That was David Van. He was a secretary of treasurer of the Cherokee Nation. Joseph Ann had been a chief of the Cherokee Nation. I'm going to have to look, do some looking on him. Is it yeah, I've got a lot of information on him. I've, I've been researching. Now, they was, don't get him mixed up with the rich Joe Van. Okay. This was Joseph Ann. There was a rich Joe Van that came in, from uh, Georgia and went. He was the wealthy man in Georgia. Spring Place, Georgia had about 300 slaves and I don't know how much land down there. He came to Eufaula and uh, he had steamships, I mean, he was quite a drinker, and they had a steamship race, and uh, he was on the ship, and he had a black guy stoking, stoking the fire, the story goes, telling him to throw another slab of bacon off, he was burning bacon, anything he could to get a hot fire, and that ship blew up, killed him, and everything, that's the end of him. But he was a rich man. Joseph Adam was, uh, he, he wasn't a poor man, I don't guess, but he didn't have the means that that one had. Now, I, had the, I met Joseph Van's uh, great-great-grandson, Joseph Van Bud. He lives in Fort Worth now. But his grandmother grew up here. Uh, it was Joseph Van's daughter. And... Uh, He, she told him that when they came from uh, Georgia, Joseph had a carriage, pretty nice carriage. And the girls would ride a while and they'd get out and walk a while. And, <laughs> but they came here in style. They, they didn't come over to the Trail of Tears. They come over about eight years, eight or nine years before the Trail of Tears. Uh, he said, his grandma said that they'd have company come and they'd take them in that grave house out there, shut, lock them up in it, trick them in getting in there and lock them up. She said they'd had a lot of fun that way. <laughs> she talked about uh, going to the slave houses. They were all along this creek south of the house. It couldn't have been many, maybe two or three, you know. Uh, go down there and they get to tell the stories late in the evening and the girls would all get scared and run home. <laughs> That was part of their activity back then. Make your own fun. Oh, I, I need to tell you some of those. Well, I've, I've got more damn stories. Okay. Uh, I know you may not want them all. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, right where my chicken houses are, I nose out a timbered thicket down there. And uh, on the east side of it, next to the field, there were some indentions in the ground, dug out places. And uh, Grandma told my dad that uh, those were uh, black baby holes. That ain't what he said, but anyway, they were black baby holes. That was the nursery for the kids, babies, while the women were working in the fields. Hmm. They, they got a place in the ground, and then they'd put uh, logs or brush around it, you know, kind of contain them, because 
I don't guess that anybody's watched them unless they were some little girls or somebody, small kids, because all of them big enough to work is out there working. Kind of like a playpen then. Yeah, it was a playpen, playpen, mm -hmm. nursery, whatever you want to call it. Hmm. So, uh, That's interesting too. Yeah, it, it is. I, I thought that, you know, past, and it makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does. It really does. It makes sense. That probably happened. Under a good shade tree. Yeah, there was the shade trees and everything there. Yeah, it was in a, a real thicket there. Anything else coming to mind? No, but I'll probably think of something later. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, unless you got something else. No, the stories are great. So. Well, we talked about the barn. And the cemetery. Oh, I might want to, we might talk about the house here a little more. Okay. Uh, these two rooms, you see them posts there? Mm -hmm. That's the studs in the walls. They're four, about five inches square, hewed out with an ax. Uh, that's all the studs in the walls of these two rooms. This particular room here has got brick, double bricks in the wall up high as your head, like it's for protection. Plumb around the three sides. They're still in there. When they put that double window in there, they got a truckload of bricks out of that. And those bricks and the ones from out at the cemetery around those graves I was telling you about, mm -hmm probably came from Joseph Vance's dad who settled out at Rose, Oklahoma, and he had a brick kill out there. I don't know if that'd be a fact, but he did have the brick kill. I don't know whether the bricks come from there or not, but it makes sense that they would have. Mm -hmm. Have you a reason for them using them to begin with? Well, it was right after the Civil War, unless that had something to do with it. Six, 1866 is when they built this, or the house, the old log house burnt and they built this, so it could be they didn't know whether the trouble was over or not, you know. So bullets wouldn't come Because the Indians fought among themselves here a lot, not not just the Civil War. These Indians, they tried to kill all of them and signed the treaty down there to move up here to start with. See, there was a treaty party that John Ross didn't sign. He went to Washington, and while he was gone, there was a treaty party that signed and, and agreed to come here, and the United States accepted it. And there was bad blood between the two factions all them years, and they killed, uh, I think it was Tom Starr. And they killed four or five. Was that ending law? Give land away or sell it or do anything with it. That was the ending blood law. And so they killed all of them but Stan Wadey. He survived. Somebody warned him and he survived and then, of course, became a general of the Civil War for the South. That's, that's an, another thing. I did remind, remember something. <laughs> Joseph Van and his son out there fought for the Confederate, okay. for the South. His dad fought for the North. His dad and brother-in-law fought for the North. Yeah. And they always said, you know, brother against brother during that war, and that's sure enough a fact. Mm. The David band that I said come from Murphy and is buried up on the hill over there, the Penn Indians killed him. They were the full bloods. Penn Indians were. Mostly fought for the North and were John Ross people. And that's another strange thing. John Ross was one eighth Cherokee. But he had all the full bloods following him. Because he was a shrewd man. I think he was an attorney, well educated. But but they did. And and to this day, <clears throat> generally I'm speaking, the full blood Indians are Republicans. The mixed bloods are Democrats. Hmm. The okay. North and South still exist. Right here. Interesting. We're about to have company, so we probably need to round it up. Okay, I'm, I'm ready to wrap it up. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. And we'll go out and take a look at the, the farm for the rest of the day. Okay.